Lord Jesus, meet us in your written word such that we can see you, the word, stepping off the pages into our life in such a way that we would be changed. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Could you imagine making a memorial, a statue, a large statue to a bug, to a bug, a pest? In 1919, in Enterprise, Alabama, they did just that. They made a monument in the middle of their city to a pest. Why did they do that? Well, for the previous two years before making that monument, they had planted cotton. And they planted cotton in every single place of ground that they possibly could. And it had been profitable for them. But along came a little thing called the boll weevil. And the boll weevil destroyed their cotton. Those that had enough resources planted the next year cotton again. But you know what happened again? The boll weevil came and destroyed again all of their crops. There were those who were lucky enough the third year and they decided to plant a little differently. They planted peanuts instead. And the peanuts turned out to be so hardy and the market so robust that they had a harvest that they could recoup and sell all of, all of those peanuts such that their debts were wiped away. And so the city fathers came together and the town council came together and they said, let's erect a monument to the boll weevil. Why? Because without the boll weevil, we would have never found peanuts. Paul is sitting in jail. He's under house arrest, chained between two guards, and he is rejoicing. He has joy that he's able to be right there. Does that seem abnormal to you? It would me. When I'm in the middle of, diverse, of adversity and challenges, when I'm in the middle of all kinds of, of, of things that are straining and pulling at me, rarely do I say, praise God, this is awesome. Normally, I say, oh, woe is me. And yet Paul sits there in the middle of jail rejoicing at what God is doing. It's an it's a amazing thing. And it causes us to ask, what motivates us? What motivates us to come to church, to serve in any way, to go out into the world? What motivates us? Is it because we're trying to prove our own righteousness, trying to prove our self-worth to someone else or to God himself? Or is it because of a joy that's rested in the gospel? Rick Warren, a, a famous pastor, he describes joy as this way. He says, joy is jettisoning your regrets. It's omitting your worries and yielding to God instead. Getting rid of your regrets, jettisoning them, them. Getting rid of them. Omitting your worries and yielding to God. That's what joy is. And joy is that kind of thing that has to be different than happiness. Happiness comes and goes, but joy is rooted and rested in something that's deeper. For Paul, what that joy is rested and rooted in is in the gospel, in the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. Paul's full of joy. Despite beatings, despite prison, despite shipwreck, he is full and yielded to God. And you can have joy as well. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 1 and beginning at verse 12. And what we're going to find is that you can have joy if you see that suffering is for the gospel. That's the first thing. And number two, if you have a heart that's set on the gospel. And number three, if you have the joy from the gospel. So that's the three points. Suffering that's because of the gospel, a heart that's set on the gospel, and joy that's rested in the gospel. The gospel, Paul would say, is served with suffering, but it comes with a side of boldness. I don't know if you ever go to Waffle House, but at Waffle House, you can get all kinds of things, but it always has a side of hash browns. Well, those hash browns, I don't know about you, but they're good. Now, my wife won't let me eat there very often, but when I can escape and get to Waffle House, I get them smothered, covered, and diced. I mean, it's just fun. And I'll eat it, and I go, I'm going to regret this, but I am having fun with it, and it's good. What's going on? Did I get an amen for that? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I see that hand. <laughs> what I love about the gospel is that Paul sees suffering and sees goodness that comes alongside of it. He sees the goodness of what God is doing. So if you will, look at Philippians chapter 1, beginning of verse 12. You can find it in your scripture sheets. 
I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul was serving with suffering. What had happened to him happened because of the gospel. His imprisonment is for Christ. You see, what Paul understood was that the gospel is not confined just because he's confined. In fact, something is changing, and it's causing the gospel to be going out even more. Now, we don't know what's changed. We know he's in prison, and so maybe the conditions have become harsher, or maybe something has, has happened, but it's not good. But in spite of the change that's not good, Paul sees it as good. He sees it as moving the gospel forward. In Acts chapter 17, they said, leave Paul and his companions alone, and they'll change the world. But what you see here is that if you confine him, he'll change Caesar's household. Why is that? Because the gospel emanates from him. He's in the middle of the praetorium. He's with the palace guard. He's under house of rest, which means that he has to pay the rent on the house that they have him arrested in. And yet he sees joy. Why? Because he notices that he has a men's Bible study that's going on, and it changes every eight hours. You see, they'd had shifts. And so the first shift, he had Bible study with group number one. Second shift, Bible study number two. Third shift, overnight Bible study. He was happy that he had a Bible study. No matter what was going on, he always had two guys that had to listen to whatever he had to say. It was a great thing. And so in the middle of all of that challenge, he saw the gospel moving forward. And he sees the whole guard begin to get the good news. You see, in the end of the book, he says, send greetings to Caesar and his household. It starts here. He's making a brief little notice that the gospel is going out, and then he sends greetings at the end. Why? Because the gospel is not just being said, it's being accepted by many people. Why is that? Because Paul realizes the reversal nature of the gospel. The gospel is always a reversal. It's set on Jesus, who, God of the universe, comes down, strips himself of all of his rights and privileges, and becomes human in the middle of our suffering and dies. But yet that death, which looks so horrible and so vicious, actually turns around to be the best thing in the whole universe. It frees men. It brings resurrection. It brings life. You see, what Jesus does is he wins through death. And it tells us that no suffering can ultimately destroy us. He's not just making the best of it. Paul is not just saying, okay, suck it up, buttercup. He's doing something far better than that. He's saying the suffering doesn't matter when you look at what really matters. And what really matters is Jesus Christ and him glorified. Everything else is just secondary. The most important thing is Jesus. And so he rejoices, and it should be taken seriously. Because he's seeing the world changed by Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine seeing the world changed? Think about our mission statement. Our mission statement is this. Trinity Church exists to, one, share the gospel, two, make disciples, and number three, equip ambassadors to change the world. Imagine if that actually began to happen in ways that you could demonstrate, demonstrably see it, right? I mean, we live that way, and we do it pretty well here inside the building, but imagine if it began to emanate out through the city of Myrtle Beach. Imagine if if all of us were so enamored with what God was doing that the good news of the gospel began to spread out. If people began to not fear death, but instead embraced life. Could you imagine what would happen in that world? Imagine what would happen if we all followed Christ as disciples, if our heads were connected to our hearts and our hands, if everything was connected and we were fully integrated human beings that were resting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Could you imagine how that would change the business world? How would it change families? How the gospel would make a difference in this community? And imagine if we were ambassadors spreading good news to a world that's gone crazy, right? I mean, just look at the newspaper the past couple weeks. There have been six shootings in Myrtle Beach. We've made the national news, thank goodness. And, and all the rest of this bad stuff has happened. And what's been the cry of everyone? Call the mayor's office. Surely he can solve it, 
right? Call the call congressman. He can solve it. Call the president of the United States. Surely he's got a solution to the problem of evil in human beings. Really? Uh, politicians solving evil in the heart of people? Just do the math there. That just doesn't work, right? The reality is we have good politicians. I like our mayor. I like our congressman. But they're not going to be able to solve the problem that's inside of human beings. Just go look at Wonder Woman. Have you seen the movie? It's great. You got to go see it. It's a fantastic movie. It's worth the 15 billion bucks that movies cost these days. It's an awesome movie. Because throughout it, it's asking where is evil? And at one particular point, the gentleman in the middle, the kind of love interest-ish of Wonder Woman, he loves her. I'm not sure what she feels about him. But this kind of, in the middle of it, he says, Wonder Woman, you're looking for evil in the singularity of a person, but evil is in every single human being. I went, yes, that's exactly right. That's the problem that we have. We all are desperate, wicked, horrible, no good, very bad sinners. But God, because of his gospel, because of what he's done in the world, because of his good news spreading out, Paul sees that as changing lives that are changing to be rested in Jesus and in him alone. And that's causing boldness to come. That's that side of boldness. Look in verse 14. What you see is that most have become confident and bold without fear. Bold without fear. Now, there's, there's all kind of boldness in the world, right? There's liquid boldness, right? Liquid courage. There's boldness that comes from your own stupidity, right? But that's not who these Christians are. They're bold without fear, meaning they see the true thing that's going on and they see the true God that lies beyond. And so they can be afraid of nothing because they trust him who came back from the dead. Paul's circumstances embolden the people to trust in what's going on. Verse 14, if you were to do a literal translation, it says, to a much greater degree, they are daring to speak the word of God without fear. They're daredevils for Jesus Christ. Daring doesn't mean that there's less danger. It means that they have more courage. They see the God of Paul and they said, what can man do to us? Kill us? Good. We die? We get to go to heaven. Big deal. What are you going to do to me? Right? It's an incredible position to be in where you're not afraid of anything, including death. You can surely live at that point, right? And that's what they're doing. They're truly living. And they're living based in a message that is consistent. Paul, if I was, if I was Paul writing this about some kind of schlub who was giving me trouble, it would be written a whole different way. I tried to do this, and this person opposed me this way, and then they did this, and it made me really mad when they did this. Paul doesn't say this. Throughout the whole of this little section, this little gem, it's all about Christ. In verse 12, the suffering advances the gospel. In verse 13, it's for Christ. In verse 14, he's confident in the Lord. In verse 15, some preach the Christ. In verse 16, what's defended? The gospel. In verse 17, they proclaim Christ. In verse 18, Christ is proclaimed. It's about Christ and his message throughout the whole thing. Paul's just a secondary bit part in the whole story. He's looking at what Christ is doing, and his heart is set there. You see, suffering comes. Suffering's normal. But if you're rooted in Christ, then you have boldness to live a true life of joy. But it comes from the heart. It isn't just the external circumstances. There has to be a heart that's going on and going right. Look in verse 15. It says there, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What he's noticing is that there's two motivations for the preaching of, God, of Christ. The first motivation is love. The second one is self. Verse 15, he says, Some preach Christ from envy and others goodwill, the latter out of love. Most of the Christians in Rome were beginning to be bold with the gospel. And they were beginning to spread the gospel, which is weird, right? How often do you look at somebody in prison and you say, I want to be like that guy, right? You're like, wow, chains, jail, sounds great. I mean, something's got to be going on in their hearts that's making them do that. 
naturally, we're self-protective beings. We want to make sure that we're safe, that we have comfort, that everything's going well. Think about most of your prayers, or at least my prayers, aren't they normally for like, Lord, let this happen well and help me be saved. Let there be a hedge of protection around all of us. I'm not sure what a hedge of protection is. We can just leap over it, but whatever. A hedge of protection around us. It's all about our safety and all about our comfort, but that's not what Paul is about. Paul's about the gospel because he sees it as so much bigger and so much better that he finds joy in the jail. And others are beginning to see it as well. You see, Paul understood that he was put there by God himself. He says, I am put here, not by his miscalculations, not because somebody's done something bad to him, but by God's sovereign choice. He sees that God is the architect of everything that's happening. And by this point, it's pretty amazing. In every way, all of the cultures, the Jewish culture, the Roman culture, the Greek culture, have tried to snuff out the gospel. But it only serves to make it inflame even more. They beat them, they put them in prison, and the gospel spreads. They put uh, Paul on a ship going to Rome. Satan himself, chaos reigns and tries to swallow up the boat. The gospel spreads even more. He gets to Rome, they put him in prison, and the gospel keeps spreading. It doesn't seem like the players are what's important, but the message of Jesus Christ that continues to go on. And so Paul is just standing there in awe. I'm chained here. I'm put here. And these chains are doing even more for the gospel. Can't put a good man down, is what Paul would say. And he'd follow up with, and by the way, I'm not the good man. The good man is Jesus who died and rose again. Follow him, see him, and it changes everything that's going on. But there are mixed motives that sometimes happen. Verse 17 says, the former are out of self-ambition. Some people have a mixed motive for sharing the gospel. Now, note, he's not talking about false preachers. He's not talking about the Joel Osteen's, your best life now, as if suffering just kind of goes away if you trust Jesus. He's not talking about kind of the the liberal Episcopal idea that, you know, we just need to have Jesus in our heart and the resurrection needs to be there because that makes us feel really comfortable and good. No, it's talking about a real literal resurrection. And he's not talking about the Judaizers that he'll talk about in chapter 3. Those people said, you got to work hard, make God proud of you, and if you do, then you'll be good. No, it's not any of that. It's being rested in what God has done but some people have bad motivations. These are orthodox believers. These are believers like you and me who don't understand the gospel. They don't understand their own sinfulness. And so out of that, they have mixed motivations. And that's pretty easy to happen. It's a thing that the world pretty much knocks on our door about all the time. You hypocrites. And it starts with me and it begins, ends up probably in many of you, You try to do the right thing, but you're trying to defend the gospel rather than to live in the gospel. We don't need to defend the gospel as if it's something that that we can defend anyway. We need to just live in the gospel. But how does it happen? It happens when our hearts are trying to find self-justification in the service that we do. And it's really dangerous for pastors. I'm going to the um, national convention for the Anglican Church North America on uh, Monday. And you know the first question that pastors generally ask each other? So, how big's your church? <laughs> oh, well, my church is uh, 350 every Sunday. Why? Because campus outreach is here during the summer. <laughs> and they count for two, <laughs> you know? And we begin like puffing ourselves up. I'm, I'm the man, right? Mm. That's not where you find the hope of the gospel. I read a, a story this week from a guy who um, he was putting his resume out there and, and I looked at it and uh, he had me looking at it. And one of the things that it said in his resume was like um, what he was currently doing and then uh, I fa- basically I failed as a church planter of 40 people. And I went, oh, I want to talk to this guy. This guy sounds really good. Why? Because he put out there his failures, his brokenness. And when I talked to him, he said, you know, I learned a lot about how not to do things and things that I did wrong. And I loved it. He was so engaging and so fun to chat with because he understood that ups, downs, it doesn't matter. It's all about Jesus. He didn't try to puff himself up and to make him look better. 
It's so refreshing to see people like that because it's in our failures that God is often working the best. It's in our brokenness that God is revealed to be good. He uses schlubs like me and, and you as well. And that's good news. It's good news that God uses broken things and brings out of that beautiful things. The problem is we become me monsters rather than grace givers. And what Paul is saying is that some have become me monsters about the gospel when they should be giving out the grace of the gospel. One of my seminary buddies, I think, capsulized it the best when he said, you know, Greg, it's possible to be right and a jerk at the same time. He was talking to me, of course. <laughs> and we all know that's true because we get caught up in trying to defend our theological position or whatever is going on. We become grumpy rather than filled with life. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, religious people constantly talk about trusting in God. But if you think your goodness is earning your salvation, then you're actually being your own savior. You're trusting in yourself. And while you may, in this case, not be committing adultery or literally robbing people, your heart will increasingly be filled with such pride, self-righteousness, insecurity, envy, and spite that you make the world a miserable place to live in for those around you. I think what Paul would, at the end of the day, say is, who's really in prison? If you're preaching the gospel out of wrong motivations, you're the one that's in prison. You've got freedom right there with a gate wide open, but you're imprisoning yourself in your own need to be self-righteous, self-justified. And Paul's saying, live free. Live free in the gospel, knowing that he's conquered death for you and all your sins, such that you can live free and open in front of people with a good news gospel message for a world that so desperately needs it. We can have joy if our heart is rooted in the gospel, if our suffering is coming from the gospel, and if our joy is emanating from gospel. If a bad heart is a joy killer, then the gospel is a joy filler. It fills you up. Paul was confined to the sidelines, but that doesn't cause him to be upset. In fact, other people are beginning to preach and they're taking advantage of the situation. They see like, oh, the senior pastor's out of the way. Maybe I can have his job, right? And what Paul says is this. What then? Verse 18. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Paul dismisses completely the fact that he's being disrespected. He, he just pushes it to the side because he sees that Christ is still being proclaimed. One commentator says this, As long as the antagonism was only personal, Paul could rejoice that the greater purpose of disseminating the gospel was being served. I looked at that and I went, As long as the antagonism is only personal, Paul's happy. That's a guy who's rooted in the gospel. When antagonism comes at me, what do I try to do? Defend, deflect, figure out a way to move it off. Maybe blame somebody else or push it off to someone else. Paul's saying, okay, you got me. I'm a broken sinner. You going to preach the gospel or not? And I love that. He doesn't care about himself. His ego, his personality, that's not what's at play here. The only thing is making sure that the gospel moves forward. You see, if you remember who you are in Jesus, then you may have shame in your life because of past things that you've done or even current things that you're broken in. But if you're trusting Christ, then you don't have to live in shame. You can live out in the open. You don't have to try to be presently perfect because you're justified by God's perfection. You don't have to play a part. You don't have to be the, the clown or the rebel or the scapegoat. You can live full and free in your identity in Christ. This is this is thinking that's rooted in Christ. He's radically committed to Christ and his kingdom and everything else just falls to the wayside. Verse 18 starts with this question, what then? It could be rendered equally, so what? Which is a great diagnostic question, isn't it? Think about your life this past week. Where did you get your nose bent out of shape or your heart mangled or your feelings hurt and trampled? Was it because of something that Christ is doing in the world? Or is it because you felt disrespected? If it's anything less than Christ, if it's anything less than Christ being proclaimed, 
Put it away. Look to what God is doing. And don't worry about yourself. Let Christ be proclaimed. No matter what credit, no matter what glory, no matter what happens in your life, let that be the animating principle upon which everything else rests and upon which you find true joy. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to this place with all kinds of motivations. We come to church, some of us, because we think we need to make you happy, or we serve at the altar or as readers or even as the priest here today because we want to make you proud. But Lord, in the midst of all that, destroy our motivations, move them aside, and help us to look to you and you alone and see you lifted up. In your holy name we pray. Amen.